Hello everyone, Mayor Tom Carnes with another episode of the Crossroads of Lincoln Park. We have an honored guest with us today, a Lincoln Park native, uh, Bill Morrison, known for his uh, work with Disney and um, of course The Simpsons and his own comic book, but it all started right here in, in Lincoln Park. So we want to, to welcome Bill and uh, dig deep into his, his past and we'll cover all kinds of secrets. And I'm just <laughs> Nothing for that. I figured that uh, since he was in, in town most recently that uh, he'd come in and we'd have a, a conversation so people can learn how he became an artist and what that process is for uh, future artists that are out there and just uh, take a look at the things that he's done during his uh, really amazing career. So first, uh, welcome Bill. Pass the mic on to you. Thank so, you, Mr. Mayor. Just give a, a good overview here. of your... Uh... Well, um, where should I start? I was, I was born in a log cabin here in Lincoln Park back in the 1800s. Um, I'm a Laclede. <laughs> yes, no, I, for any of you who are on Laclede Street or in the vicinity, that's where I uh, spent the early part of my life. I was born actually in Wyandotte at... I think most of us born at Wyandotte General Hospital. But um, I grew up in Lincoln Park and went to Mixter School, uh, went to Huff Junior High, LPHS, et cetera. And I was, um, growing up, I was just always obsessed with cartoons and comic books and, you know, desperately wanted to find a way to be involved with those things when I got to be an adult. So I, you know, I was just always drawing, as you know, I mean, you and I grew up together. So, you know, I was always drawing ca what cartoon I, characters. I can, yeah, I'll steal this uh, from you because both of us went to the same school, the Mixter, then Huff Junior High, then Lincoln Park High School. But I remember being a, a fifth or a fourth grader at, at, at Mixter and this they were showing cartoons that were done by this uh, kid the year behind us. And it was uh, Fred Flintstone, matter of fact, is, is what and I thought that this is amazing. How can somebody do this? How, you know, what type of, you know, where does this, this type of talent come from? And it's since that time, he's been amazing me since. But go ahead, Bill. So I have to know now, so who, who was showing these drawings? Because I remember drawing Fred Flintstone and Yogi Bear and Donald Duck. Mickey Mouse, all those, you know, TV and movie cartoon characters, but I don't remember, was it a teacher or who was? No, it was some nondescript, it was some nondescript kid, so I can <laughs> Oh, so kid. somebody was passing them around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. That, that's amazing, because I remember doing, you know, s sketches of characters on my notebooks and things like that, but I don't remember them getting away from me, so that's kind of funny. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I, uh, you know, being a kid in the sixties, I loved Batman when Batman came on the air, I, I went ballistic and I, um, I think that was when I decided I wanted to be a comic book artist and I didn't really know how to do that or what that entailed at that point. But when I got older, um, I started reading books about comic artists, um, the library, here in Lincoln Park had a few books on comics and I started kind of getting a sense for how you did that. Well, there, before you go too much farther, there is a, another sighting before I knew you and that was this fantastic Batman costume that you, that you wore in that, in that era. Talk about that for just a Yeah, second. well, I had a, um, I actually did a comic strip on this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it was, uh, I was asked to do an autobiographic comic like a six page uh, comic about something that happened in real life. That was the only parameter that I was given. And so I decided to do this strip about my obsession with Batman as a kid and wanting to have the greatest Batman costume. So I remember I used to, like I had a Batman t-shirt and I, I think I would run around with a towel around my neck, like most kids would do. And, uh, you know, I like it would tuck my underwear or my shirt into my underwear, wear my underwear outside my pants, you know. <laughs> um, and then I, I for uh, 
I don't know if it was for Halloween or Christmas, but I got this Batman play suit. And it was like not the kind that you buy at the dime store with the little cellophane window and the plastic mask. But this was like the one you had to order from the Sears catalog. So it was like the deluxe and it came with an actual mask and a hood. It was pretty cheesy, but at the time it was, you know, like what I thought was the best I could do. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. Then they came out with this helmet, like this plastic, I think it was Remco, uh, this plastic Batman helmet that came with a plastic cape. And the cape was scalloped um, like a bat wing. And the, the Sears one was just straight across. I was like, this is obviously superior. So I got that, and then I also got the uh, official utility belt that had the batarang and the grappling hook and all that stuff. So I melded those two things together, de the deluxe Ben Cooper uh, play suit that I got from Sears with the helmet and the plastic cape and the the um, utility belt. And I used to run around the neighborhood. like It wasn't just for Halloween. It was like you know any day of the year. And... Um, I used to get my friend across the street, Johnny Potts, to dress like the Joker. And then we would just play Batman and the Joker, and I would you know, kind of get on top of him and pretend to beat him up. And then one day, uh, there were these two guys in the neighborhood, the Sanders brothers. Dwayne Sanders was my age, and then um, his older brother, whose name I forget. Um, their mother was a really good seamstress. And suddenly... I saw them running around the neighborhood in these perfect Adam West, Burt Ward costumes. They looked like they, you know, stepped out of the TV show. And that was when I hung up my cape. I was like, I just can't compete with that. <laughs> but years later, I did a comic strip about it. And uh, the comic started there. And then it ended. The last two pages were about me introducing my nephew to Halloween. And by this time, the Tim Burton Batman movie had come out. And I I ordered, like, for 300 bucks, I ordered the the official Batman costume. And it was it was still pretty cheesy, but it was, you know, better than nothing. For you or for your nephew? For me. Oh. Yeah. Like, I, and I, I didn't, you know, I only wore it at Halloween. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, you know, I didn't run around the apartment in it. But um, I was talking to my sister this one year, my, my nephew was about three, three or four. And I said, Hey, I'm going to be home at Halloween. You know, maybe I can go with you to take Justin out for his first trick or treat. And she said, Oh, that'd be great. And I said, well, you know, what's he going to be by the way? And she said, well, I made him a Robin costume. <laughs> and I went, Oh my God, I've got this Batman costume. I'll bring it. And then, you know, we can go out as Batman and Robin and I'll introduce him to trick or treat. So that's what the, the second part of that story is about is me kind of passing the baton oh, onto yeah. my nephew. Anyway, we got way off track. Um, so anyway, I've always, I've always been obsessed with um, comics and cartoon characters. And when I, uh, I went to the um, Center for Creative Studies, which is now the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. And I studied there for four years and um, when I graduated, the um, kind of the model for getting a job in Detroit was you got a studio job. Um, and it's, I think it's kind of still the pretty much the same. We, there weren't um, a lot of freelance illustrators. It's kind of like you got a job at uh, an illustration studio or an ad agency or something like that. And... Um, the only job I was able to land was at a technical illustration studio in Livonia called Art Tech. So I, um, I worked there for two years. Uh, within that time frame, I got married to my high school sweetheart, Karen Delosier. And um, we moved out to Plymouth. And uh, so in our first year of marriage, we'd been married um, just under a year I had been working on my portfolio and I had already decided that comics might not be for me because 
back then you had to go to New York City and, and live in the New York area and get yourself established to get a job in comics because that's where all the publishers were. Um, there was one publisher that was kind of sprouting up out in California, but it was very small. So Marvel, DC Comics, all the big big ones were in New York. And growing up in the era of uh, Martin Scorsese movies and 70s cop shows that took place in New York, where everything was depicted as crime-ridden and dangerous and um, yeah, expensive, and, yeah. you know, mean streets and uh, dog day afternoon, all that. Um, I was terrified. Like I, I thought, I can't make it in New York. There's no way. So while I was in art school, I started. I had a, um, I had an instructor who introduced me to this California airbrush style that was being done on uh, album covers and movie posters and that sort of thing. And so I started sort of pushing my uh, portfolio in that direction. So I get out of art school. Um, I'm working at Art Tech. A year later, I get married. A year after that, I've got my portfolio pretty much ready to show out in California. So I, I took a vacation and I went out and just um, I booked all these appointments and showed my portfolio around. And the the um, thing that surprised me was that it was a totally different system out there. Uh, it wasn't common for places to hire an in-house artist. Uh, everybody was freelance, um, pretty much. I mean, not everybody, but um, if you're looking for a job as an illustrator, that was pretty much the uh, the way it was out there. So I would show my portfolio. I'd get a positive response generally. But then they would always, the art director would always say, give us your contact information, and if something comes in, we'll call you. And I'm like, well, if something comes in, i got to hop on a plane because I live in Michigan. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I went to this. Uh, I, had a, I had an interview at this one place called BD Fox and Friends. Uh, BD stood for Brian David Fox. And he was a, a Hollywood poster designer who'd, who'd started his own company. And it was sort of a, I guess you'd call it like a boutique ad agency that catered just to the movie industry. So they did movie posters, they did TV guide ads, things like that. And uh, he liked my portfolio. And... Uh, Again, he said, you know, give us your leave behind with all your contact information and we'll call you. And I said, well, you know, I'm really looking for an in-house position. So, you know, if you've got anything like that. And he's like, well, we really don't. But um, he said, I'll tell you what, go back home. And uh, the one thing we're not seeing in your portfolio is we're seeing a lot of finished stuff. But, you know, we might be able to use somebody who could do comps, which are like... Um, kind of rough versions of final poster designs, uh, sometimes in black and white, sometimes in color, but um, like a full painting, but just designed to get the idea across of what the final poster might be. And um, he said, we might be able to use somebody who can do thumbnail sketches for poster concepts, um, retouching, things like that. looks like you can use an airbrush. So, you know, if you do any retouching, we might be able to... Um, use something in that area. So I went home and I did uh, some of the things that he asked for, sent them out. And a couple of weeks later, I got a call at work from uh, Brian, Brian Fox. And he said, uh, listen, we just got a bunch of work in. Can you be here tomorrow? Because <laughs> we're willing to, to try you out, you know, with a staff position. And this is at like, you know, I don't know, three in the afternoon. And he wants me to book a flight and be there tomorrow. And I said, well, I don't think I can be there tomorrow, but I think I can be there the next day. And he said, okay, good enough. So, um, you know, I hung up. I booked a flight. Um, two days later, I'm in California. And I'm sleeping on a friend's sofa. And, um, you know, the, the idea was that he was going to try me out for a month and see if it worked out. And if it did, then they would give me a regular position. So after two weeks, uh, 
uh, Brian took me out to lunch and he said, well, it's working out for us. Um, seems like we have enough to keep you busy and we like what you're doing. Um, so if it's working for you, call your wife and tell her to load up the truck and move to Beverly. <laughs> so, uh, that's what we did. I, um, and literally I, I got, uh, I rented part of a house in Beverly Hills from a woman that was like a friend of somebody I worked with. And, uh, you know, care was my wife. Um, she was in a production of Fiddler on the Roof at the time. And uh, so we kind of had to wait for her to finish that role. And it was a long production run. So this was like September when I, when I went out there. And she didn't come out until after Thanksgiving. So I was out there for about two months on my own. Um, but then I went back to uh, Lincoln Park for Thanksgiving. And uh, then we loaded up our cars and we just drove out. And that was it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt at, at this point. And we'll, we'll carry on from there. But you mentioned your wife, Care. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not, um, I mean, you didn't meet after school. I mean, she was your your girlfriend since like 10th grade or, or maybe even maybe even sooner. So what I'd like to do is go back to, uh, to high school because in high school you were involved in uh, many different things. I mean, you were making t-shirts, you were involved in uh, acting productions, um, you were part of the yearbook staff. Um, the, the yearbook that uh, you made, uh, the one with the train on the cover is still you know, iconic and it was part of the Historical Museum's display actually. Yeah. So I want you to just to, to dive into uh, your high school career just a little bit. Okay. Um, well, I actually met Care. Um, Care's, by the way, her professional name because with uh, the unions like SAG and AFTRA, if there's somebody who's got your name already, you can't have that name. Like if you. Screen Actors Guild and. What's yeah, Screen name? Actors Guild, um, American Federation of Radio and Television Actors is AFTRA. And then there's um, the one for stage, which. Uh, I'm blanking on right now, but there's like three, three act, three actor unions, and there was somebody already named Karen Morrison in one of those unions, so she had to change her professional name, so she went with Care, which is uh, what people call her for short anyway. Um, so she came up with kind of a interesting way to spell that, that looks kind of Gaelic. It's K A Y R E, uh, but anyway, I met her. Um, I think in ninth grade, but we didn't actually start dating until senior year. And the way we got together was I was cajoled into being in the senior class musical, which was Once Upon a Mattress. And it was directed by my one of my art teachers, Mr. Bedoin. And um, they needed guys and they needed, um, you know, they had a lot of women trying out, but they didn't have a lot of... Um, well, girls trying out, but they didn't have a lot of boys. Um, so he talked me into trying out for a character part, and he guaranteed me I would not have to sing, So, um, which was a total lie because I did. I had like a major number in the show with, with the queen, but I, I ended, up, ended up being the wizard. So I was the character that comes up with the idea of putting a little P under 40 mattresses to test the princess to see if she was a genuine princess. Um, so anyway, uh, Care played Winifred, who was the, the princess being tested. And uh, we started dating during the production of that show. Um, it was, it was I don't know how deep a dive you want me to get into here, but um, we had kind of a, a weird start to our relationship because um, a bunch of us were standing around one night waiting for rehearsal. It was a Friday night, just waiting for a rehearsal to start. And nobody knew what was going on, why why there was a delay. Turns out there was a custodian strike. And they were trying to figure out if we could have the rehearsal or not because a custodian had to sort of be there to lock up and all that. So while we're waiting to find out what's happening, um, Kara came walking in and I was talking to another girl in the cast 
And she looked really upset about something. I had no idea what. And I said, what's the matter? You look like you lost your best friend. And suddenly her eyes got big and she teared up and she ran into the hall. And I was like, what did I say? You know, did, did I say something wrong? And our friend said, kind of slapped me and she goes, you idiot. She just came from the funeral of a friend of hers who committed suicide. So I'm like, oh my God, okay, I got to go fix this. So I went out to the hall and said, you know, I'm really sorry. I had no idea. Um, and that was that, you know, you know, she, she realized I didn't, I wasn't making a bad joke, but then rehearsal was canceled. Everybody goes home. I start calling all my friends, called you, called Steve, I called Tony and everybody's out doing something. They're all, you know, out on dates and I'm like, oh, you know, I guess, I guess the Friday night's kind of a bust. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, everybody who's in the production is kind of in the same boat I'm in. And I I knew that Karen kind of liked me because earlier in the day, another mutual friend had asked me if she invited me to the uh, spinster dance, would I go? And so that was like a little trial balloon, but it kind of gave me the idea that, well, maybe, you know, she doesn't think I'm too repulsive. So, um, I thought, you know, if I call her and ask her out, you know, it's probably a good chance she's going to say yes. So that's what I did. Uh, we went and saw Rocky. Um, and uh, that was the beginning of, I think a week later, I asked her to go steady. And we've been <laughs> together ever since. What the, I'm going to steal this from you. And I don't know what the um, the time was, whether it was after school, which I think it was. But... You told about going to California to uh, put in your resume, but that wasn't the first time that you were out there. No. I, I seem to remember a, a cross-country trip before you were married with Care, and you and you went on um, for tell a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, in uh, while I well, both of us were still in college. Um, we had a friend who was a little bit older than us, who had moved out to California. She's also an actor. Um, somebody that Care had done theater with. And uh, she invited Care to come out and spend the summer one year. So um, Care went out and they they um, both went to the South Coast Repertory Theater and took classes there. So they were studying acting. And uh, so the first time I went out to California was to visit her during that year. I think that was 1979. And uh, so I was out there for a week, and that was sort of, you know, just my introduction to California, sort of fell in love with it. And then the next year, we both decided to go out and get jobs and just spend the whole summer. So that was the summer that we drove cross-country and um, were out there for about three months and then came back and continued going to art school. But you didn't have a job when you went out, right? No. Uh, that, on that trip... Um, I actually got two jobs. I had a day job and a night job. And the day job that I landed was at a silkscreen printer in the art department. And the art department was just me and this old hippie guy. Um, and we did, you know, it was like a beach town. So we did designs for um, T-shirts and beach bags and beach towels and, and all that kind of stuff. But that wasn't the first time you've done silkscreen, though. No, Um I, I started doing silkscreen, I guess I was maybe about 14, and I read a book on it that I checked out from the library because I wanted I wanted a Captain America T-shirt, and I couldn't find one. Like, this was before you could go to John's Crazy T-shirts on Ford Street and look at the wall and get every, you know, any T-shirt design for pretty much any character you wanted. Um so I thought, well, I'll make my own since I can't find one. So I checked out this book on silk screening. I built built a silk screen frame, and I learned how to how to make a design. It was just one color, but um, I did it, and it was pretty easy. And I thought, hey, I could, you know, do this for a lot of things like rock stars and you know other characters. So I partnered with 
my friend Steve Cowell, and we went into business together. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah. So we had um, we had kind of a little bootleg T-shirt company, which uh, I, you know, in retrospect, I didn't like recognize this at the time, but um, years later, I came across this old article from the Mellis that had a picture of me and Steve like holding up a David Bowie t-shirt that we had produced. And I didn't, I mean, at the time I didn't know what copyright infringement was or, you know, what bootleg really meant. Um, so, you know, kind of looking back, I just find it funny that we were, we were engaged in this sort of a legal little business, but we were being lauded in the Mellis newspaper for being entrepreneurs. <laughs> well, I'm still, so that yeah so uh so so that was um i i think i i did um i don't think i ever did like multicolor shirts until until i was out in california but i used to enhance the shirts with um different things like i would bedazzle them with uh i had a rhinestone and stud setter you know the old ronco thing they used to advertise on tv and so I remember doing a kiss shirt that I added a bunch of rhinestones to, so it you know really glammed it up. But sometimes I would go in and, and do like custom treatments. Like I did a Jerry Lewis Nutty Professor shirt once that I took the airbrush to. So I did the basic um, flat silk screen, but then I airbrushed into it to give it like a lot of tone and um, some volume. Um, but I remember I would like hand paint things on. I did a, a, a Utopia shirt that was a basic silk screen, but then I took acrylic paints and I kind of painted into it. Um, so yeah, it got it got pretty creative. Um, so then by the time I was out in California and I got that silk screen job, I was an old pro. I was an old pro. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, so that was my day job. My night job was working at an office supply store in the South Coast Mall. Um, so I, so I was busy. I, I didn't have a lot of time for. Uh, I mean, the original idea was like go out there for sort of a fun California summer. But uh, I think I went to the beach maybe twice. But the rest of the time was just working. And then you came back from there and then back to Michigan for a little while. Right. And then where did it um, develop from there? And if you, there are several iconic pieces that you have done throughout the years. And if you could, you could touch on those also. Well, I, uh, I came back. Um, I think, I think I still had about two years left to go on in, uh, art school. So I finished up art school. Um, did the technical illustration. And then when I went up to California to live, uh, I spent about four years working at BD Fox and friends advertising. And there, because I was young and, uh, they didn't have to pay me a lot. Um, but I was in house. They, I, I did, I did all the stuff that they were looking for me to do, like the, the sketches and the comps and the retouching and all that. But I also became an asset because if a low budget job came in, like um, sometimes they would get um, they would get jobs to do assignments to do like a foreign, like an American release of a foreign film, and so they would need you know a poster for that. But it wouldn't be like a huge release; it would be like an art house film. So they didn't have a lot of uh, money to spend on the advertising or it would be one of those movies that would go right to the drive-in and it would bypass all the regular theaters. And, uh, so those were very low budget. Eventually those became direct to video movies and now direct to streaming, you know, kind of stuff you see on the Hallmark channel or whatever. Um, but they needed posters for those and they didn't have a lot of the producers didn't have a lot of money to pay. So uh, BD Fox could save money by having me do those posters over hiring a, one of the regular freelance artists. 
So I got to do posters at a very young age um, where a lot of artists my age wouldn't have had that opportunity. What, do you remember the names of some of them? Yeah, um, probably one of the biggest ones or the most visible ones was House. So I did the, the poster for the, um, it was the movie with William Catt and uh, George Went. It's a horror movie. And the, the poster image was this uh, decayed, rotting, severed hand pushing a door buzzer, like a doorbell on the side of the house. Uh, okay. And it's just kind of floating there in the air, in the air and like the uh, veins and bones and everything are kind of hanging off the back of it. Photographed my own hand as the model. And then I just kind of messed it up. Um, so that was one of the bigger ones that got some attention. Um, Here, hold on, hold on, just a just a second. We're going to segue into to something else. I was able to visit you, I think, last week or a couple of weeks ago to move a, a couple of things. Oh, is, right. <laughs> is what, but in there, there is something that the, I think it was the author of uh, that house, that that display that you have at oh, your house 3D. of that. Yeah. yeah, the 3D. Yeah, talk about that. Sure. Um, yeah, so like in the, in the uh, decades that followed, the kids that grew up like renting that movie from the video store um usually behind their parents backs cuz the the image on you know on the poster was what they used on the video box and it's you know it's pretty gory it's it's uh not something that looks like it's for kids but a lot of kids saw that that image in video stores and and uh wanted to see that movie so those kids have grown up and now become artists. And this one guy in Australia who was very influenced by the poster um, does these 3D um, versions of posters. So he's done Jaws. He's done um, a number of different movies where he creates like a box with with lighting and uh, he models the elements of the poster in 3D, paints them. Um, so like the one for Jaws, he's got like a 3D shark and he's got the little swimmer, all the graphics and everything inside of like kind of a, a display box. And somebody called my attention to one he had done for house. And, um, I contacted him, told him how great I thought it was. And he sent me one. So, uh, he made, he usually only makes one of each poster. Um, but in this case he made two, he made a special one for me. Um, so, so this has become kind of, kind of like a cult thing. Um, I, I talked to a lot of younger people, people who are like maybe 10 or 20 years younger than me who grew up with that. And when they find out that I did the artwork for that, they don't really care about the Simpsons or Disney or any of this <laughs> stuff. It's like, Oh my God, this is the guy that did the art for house. Uh, so that was one. Um, I, most of them, there, there was another horror movie, Blood Diner, that I did the poster for. Um, a lot of them were just very forgettable um, teen comedies. And um, one of them was Loose Screws was one that I did. Um, just no some idea. teen sex comedy, very bad. Um, there was one called School Spirit. Um, that one, the, art, the art's better. I'm not, I'm not too ashamed of the art for that one. But um, I, I kind of, I, I did that for, like I said, four years. And then um, one day I got a call from my boss's wife who had a little greeting card company that she ran out of the back of the building. And I also did art for, for her. You know, I did greeting card art when I wasn't busy on uh, poster stuff. And she um, called me kind of in a panic, and she said, I can't get to the office today, but um, there's a guy coming in, to, an illustrator coming in to show his portfolio. So could you meet with him and just, you know, just look at his portfolio and sort of critique it and then tell him we'll get back to him about, you know, any potential work? I said, sure. So the guy comes in, and I'm expecting this maybe – young illustrator, kind of my age, somebody just starting out. It's one of my heroes. It's it's a guy who I've emulated and whose work I've studied. 
he's one of the major illustrators in the in the industry and he's running a studio and was trying to just pick up extra work for the studio and had done a ton of greeting cards which i had in my collection that i you know used to swipe from and study and marvel at and uh you know i couldn't believe it i i was tongue tied because here's this guy who's my hero and i am expected to give him a critique of his portfolio that's ridiculous <laughs> so i mean i was just honest with him i just said you know his name was dave willardson and i said um i know your work very well you know i'm really sorry my my boss wasn't able to come in but she wanted me to look at your stuff i've seen it all I collect it, I study it, I think you're great, um, I'm not worthy, you know, I did all that. And, um, and uh, you know, because he was in my, my workspace, he was looking at things that I had, like, tacked up on the wall, and one of them was this poster for a foreign film that I did called Choose Me. And it was this, like, airbrushed, kind of close-up shot of a woman talking on a pink telephone. And he said, um, is that your, did you do that? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I thought Mick McGinty did that. And Mick McGinty was this other amazing younger artist, maybe a little bit older than me, but um, somebody else who I emulated. And uh, I said, oh, thank you. That's, you know, it's a great compliment. But no, uh, no, I did that. And he said, um, do they ever let you do freelance work? Because, you know, sometimes things come into the studio and I could use a hand. And I said, yeah, I'm not, um, sometimes it's slow here and I can, I can take on freelance work, sure. So he um, uh, gave me a freelance job and then he gave me another one. And then the next thing I knew, he was stealing me away to work in his studio. And, uh, you know, he made me an offer, which was a paid boost. Um, and I couldn't refuse it, so I took it. And uh, when I started working for him, one of most of what I was doing was um, we did some movie advertising, but also just kind of general advertising, um, product illustration. Um, you know, we did illustration for everything. You know, it didn't matter. Um, and and mostly what we did was kind of photorealistic. So I was doing um, very believable illustrations of strawberries and. Nestle's quick uh, chocolate milk in a glass with little drips of water running down the side, you know, condensation and, you know, things to make, um, I always call it kind of glamorized realism because yeah. it was photorealism, but it, it was kind of um, hyper realism. And, uh, but one day um, a job came came into the studio and by this time Dave had gotten to know me and he knew that I loved comics and animation and Disney had given us an assignment to do a poster for Cinderella which they were re-releasing into theaters so um, Dave threw that assignment to me and it was kind of like a teaser poster of the little mice from Cinderella carrying a pillow with a glass slipper on it and there's all this kind of stardust blowing off the slipper and Disney loved it. And they uh, let us do the main release poster, which was more um, elaborate. And it had the, it had Cinderella and the Prince and the castle in the background and all that. And from then on, I got to do every poster uh, that Disney, uh, or I should say a poster for every animated film that Disney put out for the next number of years. So, whether it was a new film like The Little Mermaid or Oliver and Company or it was a classic that they were re-releasing into theaters like Peter Pan or The Jungle Book. Um, I was the guy doing the poster. So that was amazing. Um, and and kind of like a, uh, a step up in, in my career because suddenly I'm doing you know, not just general advertising and not just kind of cult movie posters, but I'm doing things that are, are being seen by a lot of people. Millions. 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 Yeah. And all over the world, because they would take my poster and they would do the international version using my art. So, um, 
you know, I'd see the Little Mermaid poster in German and in French and, you know, Spanish, all the different languages. Um, so that became sort of my goal, um, you know, because I'd done so many posters for so many classic Disney films, I started looking at them, looking at what Disney had done and the ones that I hadn't done posters for. And I thought, well, you know, if Disney stays on this um, schedule, of, they were, I think, re-releasing maybe two classics into theaters per year, plus one new one. And I thought, you know, if this keeps going on, um, maybe I'll get to do Snow White and Pinocchio and, you know, Fantasia, and the ones that I had not done yet. Um, but alas, that was not to be because The Simpsons came along and uh, I got hired away yet again to uh, work for Fox doing um, basically drawings for every aspect of The Simpsons except the TV show. So all the merchandise, um, publishing, advertising, um, all that stuff. But you ended up with a comic book, though, too, from The Simpsons. Didn't you do that? Yes. Um, the Well, a little backstory on The Simpsons creator, Matt Groening. So when Matt made his deal... Um, for those of you that don't know, he created The Simpsons for the Tracy Ullman show as little uh, bumpers that would take you in and out of commercials. So when he made that deal, he was actually going in to pitch Life in Hell, which was his underground comic strip, as an animated cartoon series. That was what they wanted. And he found out just before going into this meeting that if he made the deal, Fox would own Life in Hell. He would no longer own it. And he kind of freaked out and he said, I, I can't do that. I can't make that deal. You know, I've been living with these characters for years now. I have my own merchandise going. Um, you know, that's not something I'm willing to do. So within a few minutes, the legend is like, 15 minutes while he was in the waiting room to go into this meeting, he sketched out the Simpsons and he went in and he just kind of BS'd his way through the meeting. And he uh, basically said, I know you're here to hear me pitch life in hell as a cartoon, but I've got something even better. And so he just sold it as, you know, it's the same sense of humor as life in hell but it's about a family, so it's going to relate to families, and it's going to hit a mainstream audience better than Life in Hell would with these little rabbits and guys in fezes and all, you know, the kind of counterculture stuff. And the people he was pitching to just said, well, but it's the same sense of humor, right? Because that's what we really like. We really like your comic strip. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 same sense of humor, everything, but just different characters. And they said, okay, fine, we'll make the, we'll buy that. So he, he in essence sold the Simpsons to Fox. So he doesn't own them, but his lawyer retained all the publishing rights. So he was able to generate his own publishing projects and started doing Simpsons books and calendars and anything that fell under that publishing umbrella. Um, so when I was hired to do all the uh, merchandise stuff for Fox, um, I also on the side started doing stuff for Matt for all these publishing projects. So he got to know me and um, the work that I was doing was um, very steady. So I was doing a lot of stuff for these books and magazines. And one of the projects that we did was a magazine known as Simpsons Illustrated. And it was like a kind of a fan magazine. Um, had a comic section, but it also had articles and puzzles and games and etc. So I, uh, I did the first Simpsons comic strip in the first issue, which was a little kind of like six panel Krusty the Clown comic. And, um, and then the next issue I did another one, which I also wrote. Um, and that's how I, how I became a writer, by the way. 
Um, I never knew I would be a writer, but they needed somebody didn't have a script and I wanted to draw the next one. And they said, well, if you can, if you can write a script, then you can also draw it. So I did a story based on something that happened to me as a kid. And I just turned me into Bart and turned all the adults into adult Simpsons characters. And, um, they liked it. And, uh, from that point on, I was writing the comics as well as drawing them. So every issue of this magazine, we did um, more and more pages. So I think the first one had like a page. Second issue, we added two or three pages. And then by the end of the year, we had like 10 pages of comic strips or comics within this magazine. And the end of the first year, we did a, a 3D issue. So the whole issue was 3D, and it came with 3D glasses. And it was very gimmicky, but very fun. And I, for the second, second year, um, we had to do another annual. And so once you do something cool, you have to kind of top it. And so they were thinking, well, what can we do that's cool for the annual, um, for the second annual that maybe tops the first one or is, is even more fun. And we had been having basically so much fun at that point doing the comics. That was our favorite part of the magazine. And somebody said, well, what if we just do an issue that's all comics and we actually do it as a comic book instead of a magazine? We'll shrink the size. We'll call it Simpsons Comics and Stories as sort of a nod to Disney. And, um, and then put that out. And everybody loved that idea. And uh, so we did it. So it was the first Simpsons comic. Nobody really knew it was the annual issue of the magazine because the title was different. It was Simpsons Comics and Stories, not Simpsons Illustrated. Um, so it it, it kind of just came out and people went nuts because I think people were waiting for a Simpsons comic book. And a lot of companies had approached Matt about doing a Simpsons comic and he had always resisted because in the back of his mind, he thought, well, I might want to do my, make my own company, start my own comic book company and do my own comics. So um, turns out that's what he did because this, this Simpsons Comics and Stories was so successful that it sort of gave him the um, confidence. Um, he realized there was an appetite for a Simpsons comic book ongoing and uh, so he approached me and uh, Steve and Cindy Vance, who were the editors of the magazine, and said, how would you guys like to start a comic book company? And that's that's something that very few people have ever been asked. Um, you know, most comic book companies that you work for have been in existence, you know, since you were a kid. And if you're lucky, you get to be on board and, and do some work for them. But to actually start one, to be in on the ground floor, that was just a thrill, you know. And none of us had ever really worked for a comic book company before. So we got to kind of figure out how to do things. Um, that was... Oh, I was just going to ask... Oh, I was just going to ask what the, the name of the, the company was. It's Bongo Comics. Yes. Well, Bongo. that's what, what it became, correct? Correct. All right. Um, yeah, that was the other thing. We got to name it, you know. Um, I remember Matt asking us to just write a list of names, potential names for the company. And so all of us involved, you know, we just started jotting down kind of cool sounding names. And then the, all, all of our individual lists were compiled into one big master list. And it was all alphabetical. Um, everybody liked Bongo because it was one of Matt's life and health characters was named Bongo, but also Bongo has kind of a cool connotation, you know, beatniks and all that. Drums. Yeah. And also I think the thing that clinched it was, um, the, the distributors, comic book distributors every month would put out a catalog that would go to comic retailers. They still do this. Um, and it's what they order from. So it's made available to the customers so they can go through and let the retailers know what 
they would like to special order, but also the retailers just do their master ordering. You know, every month they go through this and it's all alphabetical by company. So Matt thought, you know, we want to be at the front of the catalog rather than the back because when, when the retailers start ordering, they'll probably order heavy from the companies in the front. And then by the time they get to the X, Y's and Z's, they've already exhausted their budget. So they're not going to order as much from the companies with, you know. Sort of like AAA. You know? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Um, and I don't know why we didn't go with an A name, but um, I think just the combination of Bongo's a cool name. It's a nod to one of his characters, and it's going to be at the front of the book. Let me. So you have the the Bongo comic company, then. Right. All right. I want you to touch on uh, Little Green Men because that is where you come out, basically on your own with your with your own brand, your own comic, yes. right? Yeah. Um, one of the really cool things that Matt did when we started Bongo. Um, it, Basically, the, the titles that we came out with in the beginning were Simpsons Comics, Radioactive Man, Bart Man, and Itchy and Scratchy. So we had four titles. And then eventually we did a Krusty the Clown miniseries, but it was all Simpsons-centric. But Matt had told all of us um, from the very beginning, he said, look, I really want this company to be um, I want it to grow and expand and just be a great place for people to go for humor comics. So if you want to pitch an idea for your own comic book, feel free. And if it seems like something that fits with everything else we're doing, then we'll do it. So I, I took that to heart, but it was several years before I really came up with something. It was always in the back of my head. Um, and you know, I'm spending every day, um, editing. Now I'm an editor after the first year I became the editor. Um, so I'm editing and I'm art directing and I'm writing and I'm drawing as well. Um, so I was super busy, but whenever I had a down moment, I remember just thinking, I've got to come up with something of my own because what a, incredible opportunity you know most people don't get just handed that opportunity come up with your own comic and we'll print it you know <laughs> that was very gracious and very generous of matt um and i just felt like i was blowing it by not coming up with something so i was always kind of racking my brain and <clears throat> one day i was reading a uh, a book on the roswell ufo crash you know, the famous 1947 crash in the desert in New Mexico. And in the the account, you know, they had like a lot of eyewitness um, testimony. And one of the one of the eyewitnesses talked about seeing a live alien who had survived the crash. And it was she said it was in the back of this military transport truck and being taken to the army hospital. And I just remember thinking, wow, I've never, you know, I've always, I've heard about this crash before, but I've never heard anybody say there was a surviving alien. So I started thinking, well, what if that happened? What if there, you know, what if it really was a, a UFO full of aliens and they crash landed in the desert and one of them survived? What would that alien's life be like on Earth? And how would it? get along and um, would it be able to get back to its home home planet and so all these thoughts started you know coming into my mind and um, because of the fact that I love the period of the 1940s and the 50s and I love um, I basically love everything from that time period you know I love fashions I love the way cars looked I love the architecture um, I love the movies, everything. I thought, this is great because this will allow me to draw the kind of stuff that I like to draw and uh, tell the kind of story that I want to tell because, you know, it's it's basically um, 
I didn't realize this at first, but it's basically the Wizard of Oz. Um, it's it's a character taken out of their own time and place, put into this world that they don't understand. And uh, the alien character that I came up with um, was a reporter on his home planet and very curious and always wanted to he was like not happy with his own boring existence. He always wanted to explore the world and have adventure. And I think that was sort of inspired, uh, inspired by It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart's character. Because he wanted to build bridges and, you know, see the world. And he gets stuck in this town of Bedford Falls. Um, so I think there was a lot of that in my alien character. And when he finally gets his wish and he's in this place that is this amazing, weird, strange, magical place that he doesn't understand and doesn't fit into, all he wants to do now is get back to his home planet. And he starts to realize what he took for granted and what he's missing now. Um, so that's that was the, the origin of it and the inspiration. Um, and I, you know, I drew up some characters and I pitched it to Matt. Um, he thought it was great, and he said, "Okay, let's let's do it. Start working on your first issue." Um, so I got to I got to do six issues. Plus, we we um, previewed it in Simpsons Comics, so it was kind of like in the back pages in four installments, and then it launched into its own series for six issues, and then Futurama came along. And Matt um, started borrowing me to help him develop that. And then eventually he pitched it to Fox. Fox bought it. Um, when it went into production, I was made art director. And all of this happened while I was putting out issues of Roswell. But um, pretty soon I realized I couldn't do three things. I couldn't um, be the creative director at Bongo and oversee all that we were doing with the Simpsons comics and be the art director on Futurama plus put out my own comic book. So unfortunately Roswell had to go bye-bye. Ah, well, um, that's all that we have for, for this time. Thanks for uh, visiting our crossroads. I got to give a special thanks to our, our guest, Bill Morrison for coming here and our uh, videographer, Don Belinsky. We appreciate that. So until next time, see you later. <laughs>